Okay. So I have 5.30 on my clock. Um, so thank you. We're going to get started. Thank you everyone for joining us. My name is Kelly Bishop. I'm from the Bowers Museum. Uh, I want to thank everyone for joining us, all of our members, for your continued support during our closure. It's so important to us. Um, I really do appreciate it. And tonight we have a very special program. We're so excited. I'm so excited <laughs> um, to have Marcy Smothers with us. So she's the author of the book Eat Like Walt. Um, which is an amazing book that Marcy's going to tell us more about. It is available for sale at the Bowers Gallery Store, which is delivering during our closure. Um, and proceeds from the museum store go to our education program. So we really appreciate any um, purchases you make there. And tonight, Marcy's going to start with a brief uh, presentation, and then she'll go into a cooking lesson, and then we'll go into our Q&A. So just to recap, your mic are silenced your video um, is off for you just so the focus stays on Marcy if you have anything that you want to ask her you're going to put it into your chat box which is located at the bottom of your screen and I'm not a zoom expert but I'm happy to try to help um, so you can direct message me if you have any questions during the presentation and I think that covers it so I'm going to go ahead and silence my mic and turn my um, video off I'm gonna hop in a little later um, just to help with some presentation, but otherwise we're gonna hand the video off to Marcy. Marcy, thank you for being here tonight. Thank you so much, Kelly. Hello, all friends of the Bowers Museum. I think I see Leslie. Hi, Leslie, already one familiar face. <laughs> How awesome. Um, okay, so I think the screen just went to a beautiful picture. Um, no, I think that'll go in a minute. I'll start anyway while we fix the screen. Um, so the book is Eat Like Waltz, and thank you to Bowers. It's really been one of the most fun collaborations. I really mean that. One of the most fun collaborations I have ever done. I was asked by the Walt Disney Archives and the director, Becky Klein, did I want to do something with Bowers? And of course I said, yes, and uh, we'll talk more about that later. So that's how I became to know about the museum, even though I'm in Orange County a lot. Um, I live in Sonoma County, that's the wine country, um, north of San Francisco. However, when writing Eat Like Walt, which came out in September 2017, I wrote a lot at Disneyland for, the audi for my audience, with my audience. I consider myself the writer as much as the reader. And this next book that I'm working on that we'll talk about later that comes out in fall of 21, I have spent a lot of time at Disneyland writing that. I just feel that you can feel Walt at Disneyland and it inspires me. And so having been down to Southern California so much and not known about the Bowers, and now that I've discovered it, I've become a gigantic fan and I've become a member just like you guys. So thank you for being there. So um, now why a book called Eat Like Walt? I did a radio show for about two and a half or three years with Guy Fieri. And as a result of that, I sold my first book that was called Snacks, Adventures, and Food. It was based on a radio feature I produced. I would sort of give these food fun facts and that it was called like a donut. So then, for instance, I would say, why should you take a bath with your strawberries? And then Guy would say, have a snack with Food Guy and Marcy, the name of our show. And I would give the answer. And I called them snacks because they were like little tidbits meant to hold you over. That led to my first book. And that one came out in 2013. So after that book, my agent said, what's next? And I said, I want to write about the food at Disneyland. And he's like, well, what are you going to do that's different than Instagram or Facebook or Twitter? That was an excellent question because now everyone is constantly posting and talking about food. So I started wondering about the culinary history of Disneyland. Had Walt intended for the food experience to be immersive and entertaining, just like the attractions? And while doing my research for the proposal, I found um, a, an insert for an Orange County newspaper where Walt said, welcome to the kingdom of good eating, where the food is as fabulous as the fun, like Adventureland and Tomorrowland, dining at Disneyland is an attraction unto itself. So when I saw that, and it still gives me goosebumps to this day, I knew I had a book. In fact, the original title was The Kingdom of Good Eating, and that is how I sold it to Disney. But while I was writing 
I was using and at Disneyland all the time and I would post, you know, hashtag eat like Waltz sort of as my as I was eating around Disneyland and writing about Disneyland foods from Waltz era that was catching on. And so one day my editor, Wendy Lefcon said, well, why don't we call it eat like Waltz? And I'm like, that's OK. So that's how it got its it's got its name. It's not dissimilar to the story of Toy Story when Toy Story was being made, that was just the working title, but they had Buzz and Woody, you know, Buddy Adventures, they kept coming up with title after title, and ultimately they went back to what's wrong with Toy Story. So that's how I came to write Eat Like Walt. It was sold to Disney as the culinary history of Disneyland, and that had never been written before. But once I got access to the archives, Walt Disney archives, and I will tell you it is exactly as amazing as you think it is, it's like Christmas, you make a list, like you're writing a list to Santa. Dear Santa, I'd like to see menus from Walt's era. You just go on and on and on, memos of this, and then you show up. And if any of you guys have visited the archives, all those tables in the middle of the main room, they call it the, the reader room, it's where they sit the researchers and they just bring boxes and you open them and hope, and you find all sorts of treasures and some of the things that you've wished for and some of the things that you didn't even know that you wanted or even knew to ask for. And, I, and also, once I was in the archives, I had a new chapter, which I had not conceived of, and that was Walt's at the studio. Walt was only 39 years old when the Walt Disney Studio in Burbank opened, and all of his previous studios did not have a commissary. So he was determined to have food on the lot with his big, beautiful studio. But not only did he have one restaurant, he had four restaurants when it opened, and all of them were subsidized. Just like we think of in Silicon Valley now, Google and Facebook, et cetera, et cetera, all doing it, Walt was doing it in 1940. And he just wanted to make sure that his employees had good food at a fair price. Also obviously it keeps you productive to stay on the lot. And in the forties cars were rare and it was expensive to go off, but he really did it for the welfare of his workers. And then another thing happened while I was writing the book is that the Disney family, the Miller family, granted me access to interviews, which is pretty rare. So very rare, I think. Uh, so I would, I sat with Ron Miller several times. I had known Diane informally through the wine country because of Silverado winery, but she had passed away when I had started writing the book. But Ron and the granddaughters had met with me several times. And I had a chapter I could never have thought of, which is Walt at home. And that really, kind of is one of my favorite chapters because not, it's stories that have never been told before and I'm not going to go into them now uh, but there, there's one I do want to share because I just think it's so amazing and that is about Walt's housekeeper Fufu but here you're going to see briefly that I just want to show that list is Walt's handwriting and that is found in the Walt Disney Family Museum it is for his housekeeper her name was Thelma Pearl Howard Walt called him his Mary Poppins, and she got her nickname Fufu because Walt and Lily's first grandchild, grandson, Chris, could not say Thelma. He's called Thelma Fufu, so that kind of stuck. Fufu did everything. She cleaned the house, made everything from scratch, the food, beautiful food, no, nothing ever frozen. And it was remarkable how she was able to have all those grandkids kids underfoot, but still have them in the kitchen, singing, play with them. You know, one of my favorite stories Tam shared is that when it was Thanksgiving, she would take the turkey and wrap it in a baby blanket and say, poor turkey, poor turkey. So Fufu was beloved by all. And she stayed with the family long after Walt passed away. Uh, one of the recipes that I found in an obscure cookbook, uh, you would have had to have known that Walt, uh, after Walt passed away, Lillian married Mr. John Truyans. And in this five-star cookbook, I believe it's called, she had this recipe for Chris's cold pie. Well, that's how I knew that was Lillian Disney because Chris's cold pie has been around at the parks for quite a bit. But back of the book, there was a recipe for Chinese candy cookies. Essentially, it's three ingredients, a haystack cookie, common in mid-century America, chow, chow mein noodles, the kind of the can, butterscotch chips, and dry roasted peanuts. So when I went to my computer and started Googling Walt Disney butterscotch these cookies, nothing came up. So I knew that it was really pretty much unknown. Very excited about that discovery. That recipe is in the book, of course, which is a history book, by the way, with recipes. It's not a cookbook. And it's also, you can get it as my gift to you on at eatlikewalt.com. So I made those cookies the first time that I met with Ron and Jenny up here in Sonoma, or excuse me, in Napa, 
And when Jenny saw the cookies, she started crying and she said, you made my grandpa's cookies, you know, and um, still makes me cry. And then she went on to explain that Fufu made those kit cookies for the family long after Walt passed away and they were always available in the cookie jar in the Disney family home kitchen. Walt and then later Lily gifted Fufu stock every Christmas and every birthday. And when she retired, she'd worked with the family for 30 years and Diane and she would exchange Christmas cards. And after a while, Diane noticed that she was no longer getting Christmas cards from Thelma. Fufu, Waltz, Mary Poppins, a family member really. So she searched for her and found her in a shabby nursing ward, sharing a room with both men and women. She moved her at her expense to the motion picture home in Calabasas, private room, garden view, sent her roses every week, visited her often. And when Fufu passed away, she was worth $9 million. And that's because she perceived cashing the stock from Walt as being disloyal. She did buy a house for her development, a disabled son and a few modest things for herself. And so then the Miller family helped to establish the Thelma Pearl Howard Foundation. It still exists in Los Angeles and it is to help uh, children with uh, underprivileged, at risk children have access to the arts. So Fufu was very, very special. And now we're gonna move on to Disneyland and the recipe for tonight, I think, before I start, I'm going to ask Kelly to show that first image of the Chicken of the Sea Pirate Ship Restaurant. That's the Chicken of the Sea Pirate Ship Restaurant that existed at Disneyland on opening day. The restaurant wasn't ready, but the, the deck was, and so you could play on it. It stood or sailed, if you will, roughly where Dumbo flies today. And this is a perfect example of how much energy work time, resources, Imagineers, Walt Disney put into the eating experience at Disneyland. Every single restaurant at Disneyland, no exceptions, when it opened in 1955, were leased. Walt did not have the time, the experience, or the bandwidth to run what he called feeding operations. So this is an example of a restaurant that was leased to Chicken of the Sea, yet Walt you know, worked with his designers to make this absolutely beautiful ship for that dining experience. The next slide, let's show the mast, the chicken of the sea mast, please, Kelly, in the black and white. Thank you. This, the most of this boat or a lot of the boat was built at the studio in Burbank, like so many of the attractions were at Disneyland. And this is Mark Davis did this, the imagine, Disney legend, Mark Davis, chicken of the sea. And so it's interesting, there was this really kind of a a very big, I don't want to call it fight, but there was two tuna companies in America that really wanted this chance to have a restaurant at Disneyland, Chicken of the Sea and Starkist. Uh, Chicken of the Sea ended up winning, and it's mostly because the blonde mermaid was considered very Disney-esque and um, fit into the theme of Disneyland the best. And so there is our Chicken of the Sea. And then the next slide, please, maybe underneath it, the galley with Please. So it was in, thank you. So what's interesting is over time, they got better at theming the food. In the beginning, it was, you know, you can see there's clam chowder, that's good. The tuna burger that we're gonna make, but you know, roast beef sandwiches and meatball sandwiches. And, you know, they didn't have a lot of seafood in the beginning when they first opened, uh, but then the restaurant opened, which was below deck. But over time, it became more and more representative of a seafood type of restaurant. Thank you very much. That's all we need, Kelly. So the reason I chose this recipe is because I think it's really easy to do in quarantine, SIP, shelter in place, shelter at home, all of those. And it is most people, I don't remember this at all. I don't remember that restaurant and I don't remember this tuna burger from memory, which is really interesting because at Disneyland, that tends to be, and that's one of the ways I sold the book, what the first two questions that people ask when you're going to Disneyland is what's your favorite food and what's your favorite ride or attraction as we should say. My friend Leslie that is here and a member of the Bowers, I'm sure she would say um, ice cream. <laughs> you know, Leslie, <laughs> I'm not sure what she would say is her favorite attraction and food member memories are so inextricably bound with Disneyland, whether they be from your childhood back in the day or what you had um, 
last week. And one of my favorite stories about that are the corn dogs when the recipe was changed from the off the shelf batter corn dog that they had used at Disneyland forever, off the shelf batter, add water, mix it, make the corn dog. They rolled out kind of a fancy version. A friend of mine actually developed the recipe in the 90s. And they had more complaints at City Hall that day than they had in years. And people came into City Hall and said, where's the hot dog, corn dog I grew up with? The corn dog doesn't taste like I remember it. That's not Disneyland's corn dog. So the next day or so, uh, they went back to the original off the shelf dry batter, add water corn dog. And I love that story as an example of how we associate, one tends to associate memories in Disneyland. So for many, many people, and I hope a lot of you out there, the tuna burger from the Chicken of the Sea Pirate Ship restaurant was one of your favorites. Again, recipe, thank you, Kelly, will be available to you. It's in, I think it's, she has like a now, up there it is, or you'll be able to get it later. So you start with your six and a half can uh, tuna, which I have ready here. And you add your, the rest of two tablespoons of mayonnaise. And, and you, so you have a teaspoon of lemon juice and my cute Donald Duck. And let's see, we have a quarter, um, let's see, a cup of half, quarter cup, excuse me, of chopped celery. And we have a tablespoon of chopped onions in Mickey. See how cute these are? I try not to collect too many things because it's just too many things, but I, I do, I'm gifted a lot of the Disney cookware and it makes me happy to cook with it. So that's your, essentially the tuna mixture and we're mixing, just mix that. Now there's something here that I write about and eat like, well, there were several recipes uh, through the years. This is what I consider the original recipe from 1956. Um, there's several, their variations are very small and very subtle and any of them will work. And the original recipe calls for a uh, triple burger. Uh, so you would take a bun that's not cut, slice it in three so that you could have that middle layer. I don't have those buns and we're working with what we can right now. So I just tend to make use regular hamburger buns, what, which is what we're going to do today. And then the dressing is just a super simple Thousand Island or red sauce. And that's a, uh, I mean, I'm looking at my notes, just even though I know you have it there. It is two tablespoons of ketchup and another tablespoon of mayonnaise. So we got Mickey. I matched the red ketchup for the red Mickey for you. <laughs> and then we have the last tablespoon of our mayonnaise. Making a super simple sauce just like they did at Disneyland back in the day. Every recipe, by the way, in Eat Like Walt is authentic and it's vintage. It's all from Walt's era only. In fact, this book is a time capsule of Walt's life. It does technically end in 1967. That's only because that is when Pirates of the Caribbean, The Blue Bayou and Club 33 opened, but it is most definitely a time capsule of Walt's life and every recipe has been tested. And some of them are not that interesting or good, but they are authentic. And uh, <laughs> I strive for authenticity so much that when I was sitting with the family and asking them, you know, what was it like at the Disney home? And I said, I'm sorry to ask you this question. It seems so obvious, but what would you see when you open the Disney family refrigerator? And they just started going, oh, oh, oh. and I, I was so excited. I mean, you know, this is my world. And, I, and Coke, not Pepsi, interesting, because both Coca-Cola and Pepsi were sponsors of Disneyland when it opened in 1955. But I had the writer or the list or the memo, if you will, what was to be stocked in Walt Disney's apartment when he was in Disneyland and it says Coke. So that was my first clue that it, Coke was his favorite, but then the family confirmed it. There's no Pepsi in Walt's refrigerator, Dr. Pepper and Strawberry Crush and Orange Crush and this magic relish tray. And the magic relish tray was something that Fufu had for Walt anytime that he came in. It was on ice in a glass relish dish and the granddaughters were just amazed. It didn't matter whenever Walt would come in, that relish tray would be there and it was always on ice. And, and Marty Sklar later told me, you know what, Marcy, that's interesting because now that I think of it, we had those relish trays at the studio for a lot of meetings. So back to authenticity, and then I am a geek and proud of it. I, when I, we're, we're going to have a Disney family relish tray and eat like Walt, it has to be exactly 
like Walt Disney would have it so you can eat like Walt anywhere in the world. So I start emailing the granddaughter saying, is it whole radishes, radish coins, half radishes, radish wedges? Is it carrot sticks? How it's celery sticks? How thin? You know, turnips? Oh, half a turnip, half sliced turnip. So when, so much so that I do think that I've drilled it down to exactly the way that Walt would have seen it if he had opened his refrigerator or when he opened his refrigerator. And then at D23 Expo in 17, which was a few months before the book came out, one month before the book came out, I had a panel, very excited to have Jenny and Tam on the panel, very private people, but they agreed, and Disney legend Jim Cora. And when I got to that story about the relish tray, they kind of raised their hand and said, you were annoying, you were a nag. And I was like, I actually think I laugh still because I think that's a compliment. That's how seriously I take the vintage recipes. So back to our tuna burgers. We've made a tier of the celery, the onion, and the mayonnaise, and the tuna. And this is the mixture of the red, I'm calling it a Thousand Island sauce, which by the way, from my first book, fun fact, a lot of people, we don't know 100% sure, but we think that the way that Thousand Island got its name was a restaurant in New York that invented it and they had put relish in it and all that relish specs looked like a Thousand Islands and it was near Thousand Islands. So, but it's just a ketchup and tomato sauce. And so now, we're going to have my bread, which is on another kind. Of, I don't think that's going to read, but that is a gift that was given to me. These are Disneyland plates, and they're from Durden. I've been researching this, um, an era that was making those plates for the park. So again, you could do a triple if you want to be 100% authentic. You may do the triple decker, um, but it's as simple as we're just, you know, sauce it up. So funny, looking opposite. This is definitely something from quarantine. Looking at yourself in reverse making food. <laughs> I don't think I would do that. Then your tomato, your tuna mixture. And then the secret ingredient, the pickles. I was choosing the sweet and sour pickles. I mean, sweet pickles, sweet butter pickles, excuse me. Sweet butter pickles. We put it on top. Wrap it in foil and it goes in the oven for 300, for about 15 minutes at 375. So that's going in the oven. Normally I tell Siri to remind me, but I don't want to interrupt. And that is my chicken of the sea story. And I also wanted to share that I have, thanks to my friend, so I'm not sure how many of you know who Tom Fitzgerald is. Tom Fitzgerald is an Imagineer, a very, very high ranking Imagineer and a friend of mine. Uh, he actually has a second home up here in Sonoma County and I adore him. And he wrote the afterword for Eat Like Walt. He also gave me his, from his collection. Yes, you remind us. This is the original Chicken of the Sea pirate ship restaurant placemat with one of the res recipes that is around in the world with you can see Disneyland and I think that is what really really cool like again as I said I don't collect a lot of things but that is something that I treasure and I also wanted to point out all I had here today was Starkist but that shows you another level of how geeky I am because when I was writing the book and I had read in the memos to Walt and to Roy about Chicken of the Sea and Starkist, I thought, oh, Charlie Tuna would be a cool mascot to be at Disneyland. So I found out, wait a minute, no, Charlie Tuna what did not exist in 1955. All they had was Starkist. And as I mentioned earlier, Chicken of the Sea had their beautiful blonde mermaid. And that is one of the main reasons why Chicken of the Sea won out. But I won't tell if you use Starkest, Chicken of the Sea, Whole Foods, whichever, whichever you want. The other recipes, uh, menus that I want to share, and it's a quick story, is for Biff's. Biff's doesn't exist anymore. It was in Los Angeles, but this was one of Walt Disney's favorite restaurants. Uh, there is an entire, uh, well, there's not a chapter, there's a devoted kind of area for all the restaurants that Walt went to when he wasn't eating at home, which he ate at almost every night. He was not a Hollywood guy. He eschewed kind of the big parties and red carpet premieres. He ate often with Lillian 
on a TV tray in front of the television and she wanted to watch television. They did that. You know, when, he, when the kids were little, they ate dinner, you know, together as a family almost every night. As we probably know, any of us that are here that are big Walt Disney fans, he was a tremendous, tremendous family man. Well, at Biff's, he called those potatoes done right and asked Thelma Fufu to go to Biff's and sit at the counter and not leave until she could figure out how to make those hash browns just like this did. And so she did as her boss told her to do. She decided they weren't hash browns, they were home fries, but whatever, he's the boss. And she came back and she started making essentially the same recipe, but now she told Walt, these are Biff's potatoes and he was much happier. And what I was gonna say about all the different restaurants, there are some of course that are still open, Smokehouse and Tam O'Shanter being two of the big ones that we can still visit today that where Walt went. When I, this is an example of collaboration with the Walt Disney archives. And again, I'm so honored to be with Bowers and that, that they were chosen for this amazing exhibit. The Walt Disney archives, I said, well, can you tell me how, where Walt ate when he wasn't eating at the studio? It took two archivists a week to go through Walt's desk diaries, every single one. And they compiled a list of where went, Walt went and how many times he ate there. As, and that's much information, that's a lot of information. And it was so much so I couldn't fit it into the book. It came kind of at the end of the book writing process, but I do have a list of the restaurants in that book and what, what the ones that are no longer open at let's such as Biff's and the ones that you can still visit. The other, uh, I have a really cool from another friend of mine, Tahitian Terrace, love that restaurant. If, boy, if I could do some pop-ups, I would be doing restaurant pop-ups. You don't want to get me started on all the Disneyland vintage restaurant pop-ups I'd love to do. But yeah, the Tahitian Terrace now in the tropical hideaway, they've done one before that was a, kind of a private event. But yeah, bring back the fire dancers, bring back the authentic food, you know, do them kind of late at night and off times. Who wants to go raise your hand? Uh, and then a treasured one from 1940, Walt Disney's Studio Restaurant. And what's interesting about this is, and I write about it in Eat Like Walt, you can see Walt was thinking of theming food even in 1940 because there was the monster this, the Snow White that, you know, a lot, several of the food items had Disney character names on them. And something else that's really interesting is that the Monte Cristo sandwich is on the 1940 studio menu. Uh, I done, did a little research, you know, even though we think of it as being our New Orleans Square go-to sandwich, both at Blue Bayou and, and at Cafe Creole, Cafe Orleans now. It was started at first seen for Walt on this menu. And it's a Southern California sandwich. It really has nothing to do with New Orleans, but a highly regarded chef, his name was Hideo Indian, was his nickname. He's the one that brought that Monte Cristo to New Orleans Square in the 60s. And the Indian story is one of my favorites. I'm looking at the time, I think we're okay. Yeah, uh, that he was a re really big tall guy. In fact, Imagineer Kevin Rafferty called him large and in charge. Um, and he was working at the Plaza Inn one day and Walt was walking around and he heard all the cast members say, hey Indian, hey Indian, hey Indian. And he comes up to Indian. Now Indian was Japanese American. He was raised in Hawaii. And he got the nickname Indian because he played on the AAA team for the Cleveland Indians. And it's just been his nickname since he was a teenager. Uh, so Walt comes up and he's looking at him. He's kind of surveying him. He goes, is Indian what everyone calls you? And he says, yeah. Walt says, all right, well, why don't you put that on your name tag? That's significant because that's believed to be the only time that Walt allowed somebody to have a nickname on their name tag. And that was Indian. And the last menu I want to show you I'm so excited is from the Bowers own Tangata restaurant. It is an eat like Walt menu that when the museum reopens and Tangata reopens with Chef Stefano, he devised all of these several of Walt's favorite recipes and he reimagined them for the 21st century. So anybody who goes to visit the Walt Disney Archives 50th anniversary exhibit at Bowers can also eat like Walt. Okay, well, oh wait, one more thing. Anyway, I was going to do one more thing for you guys. If you're going to make a Scotch Mist, Walt's favorite cocktail, there are two acceptable scotches to be authentic. One is Canadian Club and the other is black and white. I like to refer to Walt's favorite cocktail as an adult snow cone because really, what do we have here? We have crushed ice, 
It's gone. And also on his uh, memo, what is to be stocked in Walt Disney's apartment at Disneyland, it's listed both Canadian Club and Black and White. So you may choose. The other fun thing that I learned and had never been told before from the family was that they used to put, Walt and Lillian used to put oranges into their scotch mist all the way down. And uh, they would have these long silver spoons or sometimes plastic, I don't have them, stir it up. But the grandkids love to fish out those oranges, you know? And so I heard that from Ron, Jenny and Tam. But then there is a, on YouTube, kind of easy to find, very interesting, an interview with Lillian, Diane and Jenny when Epcot opened and uh, after, just after Epcot opened, I believe it's 1982. And they talk about the story and Diane says, yeah, Christopher used to say, when I grow up, I'm gonna have the same drink that granny has, you know? <laughs> and how the kids, little eyes, Lillian describes little eyes coming up to fish out the orange from the Scotch Miss. And so this is just a toast for Walt. Thank you. Okay, Kelly, turning it over to you. Okay, well, thank you so much, Marcy. That was really fun. I'm definitely gonna try it myself, although, I'm going to admit to everyone right now that I did make my smoke alarm go off when I tried to make pancakes this morning. So <laughs> that's not, <laughs> not the best one to do this, but um, we wanted to open it up now to Q&A. So if anyone has any questions, um, please go ahead and put those into the chat box, which will be located at the bottom of your screen, unless you've moved it to the side. I did note a couple of things um, that people posted as you were talking, uh, Marcy. So one that isn't a question, but it's a comment that I feel is worth repeating, um, is that Ron, one of our members, um, worked on the tuna boat uh, at the 1968 grad night. So that's really fun. Wow, <laughs> wow. that's the closest to a cast member. That's fantastic. I know, so fun. Um, and then Rosie asked us if we could please post the cookie recipe. I don't know. I will happily send it to you for sure. And okay. it's also like walt.com, but please, I will send it right after we get off air, whatever we're calling this, Zoom. And then, yeah. And then I'll go ahead and post it um, when I send the video out to our members. Right. Um, there's more coming in right now. I don't know. Do you want me to kind of read them off to you, Marcy? Is that easiest? Okay. So one question is um, from Donna. She asks, have you thought of doing the history of Club 33? Oh, that's interesting. I do have a, um, quite a, a fair amount about Club 33 in Eat Like Walt. I don't know if it merits its own book in my world I'd, and or if they would even want it, you know, because I think part of it is the mystery behind it. But what I write about in Eat Like Walt is that it was often thought that it was for the 33 lessees that um, opened Disneyland. Well, I, I know that's not true because I actually, I know how many lessees and there was way more than 33, um, that it was to get a liquor license because you have to have an address for a liquor license in California. Walt, by the way, was opposed to liquor at Club 33 when it opened, before it, when he was planning it, excusing me. Um, but pretty soon he realized and he did like his cocktails that, you know, he, he wanted to entertain people. As a side note, it's kind of fun. Um, he had something before Club 33, it was called The Hideout. And I saw that in two or three memos where Walt says, the hideout stays, you know, budget cuts. And you can see red, hideout stays, Walt, you know. So the hideout, the original one was where the plaza is, is now. Um, it, then it was the Swift's Red Wagon Inn. And it would be on the Main Street side. You can still see the original triptych windows when you're on first aid. And it was kind of a large room. But when Walt took back the plaza, took back Red Wagon Inn and reimagined it as the plaza inn, that space was needed for a kitchen. So he made a new hideout on the Tomorrowland side. And you can still see it. If you go on the Tomorrowland side, all the way by the restrooms, tucked away on the, on the porch is a small door and it has a stained glass window. And that was Walt's private entrance. So he had intended for something much bigger than that tiny room. And that's really how Club 33 came to be. Back to the name. So also it wasn't for the liquor license. It, there's really no addresses at Disneyland other than Main Street USA, a few in Frontierland and New Orleans Square. Harriet Burns said it happened to be the number of the door that they used. I mean, there's several theories. And what is true is that Jim Cora, 
Disney legend Jim Cora, who retired as a chairman of Disneyland International, is now, I would consider a close friend of mine, and he calls himself my intern, not me. He said when he was working at Retlaw, which is Walter spilled backwards, that's the company that held, because uh, Walt owned the trains, he owned the monorail, he owned Walt Disney's and Planet Tiki Room before he sold it back. And so when Retlaw got a memo saying that, that it was, um, that there have now, congratulations, now we have 33 lessees for New Orleans Square. So that does make sense timing wise, but the most endearing theory that I heard, and I was the first to publish it, as far as I know, was that Walter Miller, uh, well, he thought it was for Diane Disney Miller's birth year, 1933. And that makes a lot of sense considering, you know, and there's other, there's more to it. I'm going to go, I could go on and on like the 21 club, Walt loved the 21 club in New York. The articles, articles of incorporation for club 33 say 33 club, just like 21 club. So there's, we'll never know. Uh, and a lot of people are st strong opinions. So I offer them all and, or as many as I know now, there'll be more in the next book. And I go with, I'm going to vote for the sentimental and go with Walt, which by the way, Walt was very upset when the first grandchild was named Christopher and not Walter. And he said to Diane, and you know, why, why didn't you name him that? And Diane kind of flustered and wrong. Well, we thought it was a horrible idea to saddle somebody with that name. <laughs> like, <laughs> and essentially after that, they had a contract that the next boy was gonna be Walter, but then they had Joanna, Jenny and Tam, and then another Walter. Oops, so sweet story. Thank you, that's, that's what I know for now, but uh, yeah, uh, there's a lot to find online. Some of it's not true, by the way. <laughs> okay, so the next question is from Amira. She asked, how long do you bake the sandwich? 15 minutes, and I have been, I should, I think I looked, yeah. I have lost complete track of time, but let's look. Oh, no. <laughs> You're yeah. going to make the smoke alarm go off just like me. <laughs> well, it's interesting. I'm a pretty good cook. I don't usually get smoke alarm, but I have. <laughs> had... It would be my fault. <laughs> warm tuna milk, right? Oh, the bun's perfect, yeah. Yeah, just it's very toasty. That's the thing. It's toasty. And this cheap, these cheap hamburger buns, all the preservatives make toasty. <laughs> okay, um, next question is from Jay. He asked, does it matter if the tuna is packed in oil or water? It's not, I mean, I use water. Uh, it doesn't matter. I imagine though, that's a very good question. I imagine that back in the day, it was probably more packed in oil for preserve, different preservative reasons, but I don't think there's a reason. It's an intriguing question. And um, actually, let me see real quick if my placemat says that, because I never thought of that. So this is why, mm -hmm. I let's see. Darn. Doesn't say whether it's packed in oil or not, so. If I find out, I'll email Kelly and she can let you know. It'll okay, probably... next question from Nathan. He asks, what's on the relish tray? What's on the relish tray, great question, is turnips, radishes, carrots, celery, pickles. Okay, and then from Joe, what were some of the other restaurants at the beginning of Disneyland? Some of the original restaurants from 1955. Uh, well, Carnation Cafe was there. And then it was, of course, leased by Carnation before Walt took that back later. In fact, he was able, he, because he didn't have the wherewithal to open these restaurants or the money on his own, every, and he needed the money from the lease, he had this very clever condition. He paid the first year's rent and the fifth. So nobody could, you know, they was, he knew Adam for five years, right? And, uh, but he was able to take a lot of these restaurants back. So Carnation Cafe, uh, that was then Swift's Red Wagon Inn. Now Swift also had the chicken plantation, which is roughly where Cafe Orleans is now. That's when the Rivers of America and the Jungle Cruise was one big giant waterway. There's just a little tiny path. It was two-sided. Um, the What is the pavilion, which is now Jolly Holiday, that was there also two-sided and you could come in or out from the Adventureland side or you could come in from the Main Street USA side. What was at Tomorrowland that barely got that open? There was the space bar and that, you know, the yacht bar, yacht bar, which had some room sandwiches, but those are gone. In Frontierland, there was uh, then was um, the Frito Casa de Fritos, and our Frito house is like Ron referred to it as Tuna Boat. 
Frida House, Doolin was an amazing guy. Mr. Doolin basically saw Fritos being made in Mexico on a street. He bought the patent from the dude, like these extruded corn chips in Mexico, came to California in his mother's garage, which I think that is a book because, I mean, wasn't the, you know, Macintosh was invented in a garage. And he figured out how to make Fritos. And so that's kind of made him a big deal. He also invented and got the patent for the tortilla, the cup, the fried tortilla cup. So Casa de Fritos was one of the first restaurants there. And it was located right next door to where Riverbell is today, which was then, and that's an opening day restaurant. And that was Aunt Jemima's Pancake House or Aunt Jemima's Kitchen, depending on what time of year. And they did have a woman, an actress, Arlene Lewis, portraying Aunt Jemima. And she would be cooking and kitchen and sort of as a hostess and in really an ambassador of the restaurant. And she and Walt loved each other. And Walt would come and sit with her and have pancakes in the morning um, early before a lot of the guests arrived. Casa de Fritos was so popular and their signature dish was the ta cup made in Mr. Doolin's frozen tortilla cup, uh, frozen, mm, fried, take two, fried tortilla cup. It was just essentially fried hamburger and lettuce, tomato, and cheddar cheese. That was the ta cup. I searched for the ta cup recipe. I have one picture of it in Eat Like Walt. Couldn't find it. It's one of the three recipes that I had to reimagine myself was the ta cup because I thought it was really important. So then they moved over to where Rancho Zocalo is today in 1956 because they needed a lot more room because they were that little restaurant, little slice right next to what is Riverbell today. And a really cool homage is the original California flag that flew over Casa de Fritos is still there. If you go inside the restaurant behind the salad station, it's framed um, for cast member area, but you can clearly see it. What went into that space in the 60s um, or late 50s Casa de Fritos space was the only restaurant in the history of Disneyland that ever had someone's name on it other than Walt Disney or one of Walt's characters. And that is Don DeFore's Silver Banjo Barbecue. And I don't, didn't know who Don DeFore was. Find out he had big shows, Hazel and Ozzy, Ozzy and Harriet. And I went and saw at D23 a show that his sons do called Growing Up in Disneyland. And it was fascinating. So we became friends. And when I was writing this book, I said, do you still have the Silver Banjo Barbecue recipe for the sauce? And they said, that's an interesting story. Dad was an actor. He didn't know how to cook. So he went to Love's Barbecue in the Valley, which I grew up in the San Fernando Valley, and he bought every week he would go to Love's Barbecue and he would buy their sauce and he would bring it down to Disneyland. Pretty soon they're running out of sauce. Love says, we cannot give you any more sauce in this. We've got our own restaurants. So Ron did a very clever thing. He went to, to UCLA Chemist Lab and he asked them to break down the sauce. So they broke down the sauce. What happens is they can give you the ingredients, but not the amounts. Ron's, um, Don DeFore's wife, worked in her kitchen for two weeks to figure out that recipe and that's what they're used till they closed. They gave me that recipe for Eat Like Walt. They've never published it exclusively for Eat Like Walt. It's a super fun recipe to make. It is something Walt would have eaten because he loves Silver Banjo Barbecue. And that's my more fun from doing research. That's amazing, what a story. Um, I'm just going to read a comment also. So Deborah says, thank you. I could see hearing more of Marcy's info regarding Walt's life. And Alexandra asks, any thoughts on future food tours at Disneyland once they reopen? I mean, I, yeah, I mean, I would love to do a vintage, you know, that would be a, a dream of mine. And, you know, that parks is a whole different world from publishing. And again, I'm just the geek that goes to Disneyland all the time. I am, um, I am writing another food book. I am writing a Walt Disney World 50th anniversary cookbook with my friend Pam Brandon. So I'm going to dive into that. Um, and I really do hope one day that we can have an experience like that at Disneyland. I just have to take it one project at a time. My other book, my big, I call it my big book is called Walt's Disneyland, A Walk in the Park with Walt Disney. And it's a guide to Disneyland told in Walt's words and the people that knew Walt. And my standard in Eat Like Walt was everybody knew Walt, no exceptions, no third person. And it's the same thing. And so I've been spending now, it's been two years finding these quotes from Walt. I, and the idea is that there are a lot of, fantastic fact books about Disneyland, but, and this has facts, but it's about feelings. It's about the feeling that Walt wanted you to have that we still have 65 years later. And when you hear it in his voice and people correct me and say, you mean read it. I'm like, 
no, you hear it. We've all, any of us, you know, most people have heard what, and you can hear him like, no, 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 no. I mean, he was famous for all those news. So, you know, it, it, so it's a way to look at Disneyland through his eyes and his heart. And like, it may be like, you may know some of these things. I'm sure that there's some you cannot possibly know because not even Imagineers or family know. But at the end of the day, it's a way to walk around Disneyland and feel like you're with Walt and hearing what he wanted you to experience while you were in the park. Wow, that sounds amazing. Um, okay, next question. Robin asked, did Walt also eat at Patty's Diner? Patty's Diner. Now, this has been a couple of years, so I'm going to have to look that one up. If he did, it will be in, because I trust my archivist friends. I need that music. Dun, 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 Hold on, recipes, Patty's Diner. There's a whole bunch of them. I probably can't really see. I do not see Patty. That doesn't mean it because I'm reading really, really fast. I do not see it at first glance. It could, and I could be wrong. So, yeah. Okay. Um, another comment, Amira said, um, think tuna was originally all oil packed. Oh, yeah. so maybe that. That would have been my guess too. Yeah, off the top Amazing. of my head. Thank you. Mid-century. Um, I'm sorry, Robin says, what was Walt's favorite dessert? Well, interestingly, he wasn't a huge dessert guy. And I don't have, it's in the book, as I was showing you the list of Walt Disney's favorite foods, um, there is the desserts listed, which are in the book. And they are, here is, this is just my copy. But, you know, you can see down there, it says desserts. And it's so sweet because you see his loop-de-loos and everything that looks like Walt's writing. By the way, he made this list for Fufu because he was really sick and tired of Lillian's food. She made the same thing in rotation all the time. And Lillian was sick and tired of Walt because he would come in and say, oh, I'm full from lunch. Uh, I don't really like, if he didn't like the food. So Lillian started calling the secretaries and saying, you tell me every single day what Walt has for lunch. And so she was ready when he came to the house, like, I don't want that. I had chili. You did not have chili. Anyway, and you can, and that part of that's in the Pete Martin book, My Dad, Walt Disney. So anyway, the desserts, jello, all flavors with pieces of fruits, diet custards, pineapple, fresh or canned, fruit, fresh or canned. We know that he liked butterscotch a lot. He had an ice cream soda um, fountain in his home and he liked to make ice cream concoctions, you know, for his kids. But he also, when he had friends over, he liked to make ice cream concoctions that he thought were really weird and then hand it to him and then nobody would say no to Walt Disney. And he was like, he loved that. Um, yeah, and so those those Chinese butterscotch cookies, we know that he really loved those. So yeah, and 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 the kids told me, the grandkids told me, apple pie with cheddar cheese on it. Okay, wow. Um, Frida says, I was there in 1956, remember the tuna burger well. Um, that was probably talking about one of the restaurants that we mentioned, so that's fun. Um, Teresa asks, what's the recipe for the hash brown potatoes? Well, basically it was just, they really weren't hash browns. They were really like more than home fries, just onions and potato. Um, in the, in Eat Like Walt, though, I do have Oscar's potato recipe. Oscar was the other famous chef in Walt's era. He's still the longest tenured cast member. He started in 1956. And so for potato recipe, since I didn't have Thelma's recipe that what she made for Walt I used and I wanted Oscar to have a chapter because I love Oscar. So Oscar's recipe for it's his potatoes that are in there. Perfect. Um, Matthew asked, did Disneyland invent Doritos? Uh, this is another one that is, thank you for that. Great story, Matthew. Again, don't believe everything you read on the internet. Here's the thing that I will say about writing for Disney history and I'm completely honored uh, to be able to lucky one to be able to do it about Walt's Disneyland. And I found a quote, just one brief digression from Herb Ryman that he said to another writer, but was meant for all writers. It's for people like yourself to have the privilege and the duty of presenting Walt as a human being, someone that can be known, a person that you can be close to. Those were my guiding words. This book, next book, Walt. The one thing that everyone says about Walt when you meet the people that knew Walt or you read in the archives, they all want to tell you he was a human being. He was a decent, great guy, but he was human. So um, with this, it, with entering into history, I had four archivists and Dave Smith, Disney legend Dave Smith, vet the book. So I, I say that was like defending a PhD. So that comes to the Dorito story. There's a lot that we believe and that we know and I can prove and there's some that it's lost to history. So in this case, 
I have to say this author believes, but this author, this author believes at 99%. So the story is Casa de Fritos making that, you know, the, the tacos and everything. They didn't make their own tortillas. So an Alex Foods company in Orange County would deliver the tortillas to the restaurant. And one day the delivery driver sees the stale corn tortillas in the garbage and he says, hey, dude, we don't do that in Mexico. We cut them off and fry them in little triangles. So, you know, they started doing that for the chefs and they were really delicious and they were so good. They started putting those triangles, little golden triangles, that's what Dorito means, little golden, out to the guests. Well, one day, one of um, Arch West, one of the VPs for Frito Lay is walking by and he doesn't see Fritos on a plate. He sees these little golden things and he is not happy. Goes in, da 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 da, da tastes them like, mm, pretty good. Fade out, fade in. They're so good and so popular. He contracts with Alex Food to make the Doritos. But within two years, they Frito Lay took it back and they manufactured them themselves, and Alex Foods was out. Now, the thing is, the geek is like, mm, little golden things, but they're orange. So, call Frito Lay, not once, not twice, not three times, not four times, I don't know, 15 times trying to get the answer. Finally, I get the sympathetic error. Do you know when, when you, how the orange started? And he goes, oh yeah, started in, I can't remember the year now, I'm, my head's in another two books, but let's say, yeah, we put the orange on in 1968, the orange uh, spicy chili seasoning. So for two years, they really only were little golden things that were invented at Disneyland. And then later they added it and they made them orange way before we had a gazillion different flavors of Doritos. Thank you for that question, Matthew, love it. Wow, I did not know that. Um... So Pamela just says Patty Sander. Wow, that takes me back 40 years. So more memories for folks. Um, and then Donna asks, uh, did you find out about the pancake races down Main Street? I sure did. And that is an interesting thing too, because you know, you sell a book based on the food of Disneyland and the culinary history. And you know, there's only so much of that stuff that you can find before you have access to the archives. But I did find uh, in the archives, this photograph. And I remember freezing and then Becky Klein had written an article about it. So it wasn't really unknown, but it was certainly unknown to me. And the pancake races started, they didn't have, when, when Disneyland opened, they did not have a lot of money for pageantry or for parades, you know, that was very limited. So this gentleman had this idea about adopting the pancake races, which were happening in liberal Kansas. And it really goes back to something from 500, the year 500, when in England, this woman, legend goes, was using up the last of her fats and making pancakes before Lent. And then the shriving bells rang. And so she ran to church wearing her apron and with her skillet with her pancake in it. And everyone in church thought that was kind of funny. So they started these pancake races ever since then. Some person had figured out to bring them back to liberal Kansas. And then they brought them to Disneyland and had tied it in to Quaker Oats and Aunt Jemima's uh, pancake house. And so here was the idea the, the contestants would wear their aprons. You had to wear aprons and their saddle shoes down Main Street, and they had to flip the pancake over a ribbon that is as high as a regulation men's volleyball net, four times up and down Main Street, USA. And the first one there wins the prize. And so Aileen Lewis, who was Aunt Jemima, played the character of Aunt Jemima, was a judge, Clarence Nash, the voice of Donald Duck. And yes, it was a real thing uh, for several years. And yes, I want to bring them back. <laughs> nothing to do with the parks. I, I, I you know, I'm just the writer, uh, you know, the storyteller. I have nothing to do, but if, you know, boy, if, if we could have pancake races, but please, I'm sorry, Kelly, I'm not going to ask you to make the pancakes. I mean, <laughs> something to think about for the Bowers programming when we get to reopen. Yeah, I don't want burned ones. Yeah. <laughs> Um, and then we just have one more comment from Astari. says, amazing Dorito story, Marcy. Thank you so much. Um, I think that's all of our questions and we're just about five minutes before we're supposed to end anyway. So unless there's other questions, I think we're good to wrap it there. Thank you so much, Marcy. I really, really appreciate it. Um, we couldn't do these series without the generosity of our speakers. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It's appreciated. Um, to all of our members, thank you so much for joining us tonight. We are working on archiving all of our past Friends of the Bowers live stream video and I will be releasing a few of those um, this week that have already passed. Um, and next week we have Alzheimer's OC to give us a talk on 
caring for the caregiver during um, quarantine. So really important topic. We hope you all can join us. Um, we're getting a flood of thank yous. So thank we'll just say from the whole group, Marcy, Thank you so much again. Really I can see them. Thank you all. And I really look forward to seeing everybody at the Bowers when the time is just right. Awesome. And one more reminder, we are selling Marcy's book, Eat Like Walt, on the Bowers Gallery store. Um, it's at shop.bowers.org and proceeds go to benefit our education programs at the Bowers. So thank you so much for all of your continued support. Thank you, Marcy. And we'll end it there. Have a great night, everybody. Nice. Thank you. Eat Like Walt. <laughs> Bye -bye. Cheers, Walt. Cheers.